Well, good morning, Calvary. How is everybody today? This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Say that with me. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. For those of you I've not yet had the opportunity to meet, I am Chad Anderson, the executive pastor at Calvary Baptist Church. I serve with an amazing group of volunteers, support staff, and other ministers here serving Calvary and extending out past Calvary uh, that's here. We just heard uh, a video and watched a video with some real rich words from our, our lead pastor, Chad Garrison, who is on sabbatical. He's been on sabbatical for about three weeks. He'll be returning from sabbatical in about three weeks. So continue to pray that God enlightens him, refreshes him, encourages him, and gives him vision and insight as he leads us as, uh, as his ministry. Those of you who really know Chad know that he loves Calvary, knows that he loves people. And I, I knew that he'd figure out a way, right, to show up and share some, some godly wisdom with us, whether he's on sabbatical or not, right? We started a series a few months ago. Actually, it was in April, believe it or not, when the temperature was about 70 degrees. Now, I don't know what the temperature was when you got in your vehicle this morning. Mine at uh, 6 o'clock this morning was at 88 degrees starting off. So I, it was a little bit warmer now. So we're progressing along, and the series is getting hotter and hotter and hotter. How not to be an idiot. Now, some of you may have listened to God's words and may have changed some things. And, and you're having some success. Some of you, this may be your first opportunity to hearing and going, man, I don't know where he's going with this, but uh, you got my attention thus far. So we hope that you will hear some biblical truth today and that the Holy Spirit will enlighten you as to the direction that we're going. So I hope these words that we're sharing change your life because the mission of Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship. We do that through the love of Jesus Christ and through the truth of God's Word, and we do that on a daily and a regular basis. Um, there's a couple of things that when we started this series in Proverbs, Chad asked us, read Proverbs. Proverbs were instructions that were given to a father as he was raising his children, and they were very practical. Now, some of us want to use them as commands. They're actually not commands. They're instructions. They're directions, and hopefully they've changed your life. And one of the things that I started doing is I have a, a pretty hectic schedule. I, I know everyone here does. And so one of the things that I do is I try to find ways to utilize my time a little more efficiently. In other words, I was taught work smarter instead of harder. And one of the things that I found out, you know those little electric devices, electronic devices that we have in our pockets called cell phones, smartphones, iPads, iPhones, i this, Android, that? It's got a little button on it. You can press it. And you can type in YouTube on it, and you can go to YouTube, and then you can type in pretty much any book of the Bible, and it'll bring up about 10 different translations, and some of them have dramatic presentations. And I don't know about you guys, but I like hearing somebody read to me, especially if they do a little bit of an inflection. So one of the things that I started doing each morning when I got up is finding the book of Proverbs. I personally like the ESV version that was on there, a dramatic presentation. And I would listen to it each day. And so for several months, I've been listening to the book of Proverbs, just listen to it over and over and over again. If you've got a favorite book that wants to, that you want to listen to, that may be a way that God can transform your thinking on a day-to-day -day basis. And notice I said that when I started out my day, because that sets the pace for the rest of the day. Now, one of the duties that I get to enjoy, um, and some of you are going, oh, I don't like that as executive pastor, is to be involved in the money management process at Calvary. And I'd like to share just a couple of ideas um, that we've developed uh, on a daily basis to help us as a ministry not be total idiots with our finances. And the first one of those is a very simple process, very understandable process. And most of you have probably already figured out and filled in the blanks. Let's see if you got it right. Trust God, not money. Trust God, not money. Proverbs eleven twenty eight says it this way. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. What this verse is saying, in essence, to us is we have a certainty of gain. 
if we trust in righteousness and integrity compared to the certainty of loss in trusting in monies and foolishness and wickedness. You know, we started our series uh, talking about trust. Chad mentioned to us in Proverbs 3, which is one of my life verses, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and it's a guiding verse for me on a day-to-day basis. Trust in the Lord with all of your understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. So let's go back and look at this. Trust in the Lord with how much? All your heart, and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge God, and he will direct your path. You see, God loves each and every one of us. He loved us so much that while we were still in a sinful state, God chose to allow his son to be the sacrifice for the forgiveness of my dirty, rotten, filthy self, and as likewise of yours. And he gave himself to us. He gave us access to all of the riches that he has. If you, excuse me, have confessed with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you've believed in your heart that God's raised Jesus from the dead, that ushers you in to becoming a child of God. And by being a child of God, you have all of the rights, all of the privileges of a child. You have access to God and his riches. Now, here's the the cool part of it. God gives you those riches to fund his purpose and his ministry that he preordained for each one of you in his life. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I just kind of like, hey, God. Have you forgotten me down here? You know, I could use a little blessing, Lord. I, Lord, you know I'm going to do the right thing. Come on, give, get, just share a little bit. And here's what I find out. Every single time that prayer matches up with God's desire for his purpose in Chet's life, guess what happens? Wonderful blessings happen. And you say, well, Chet, you know, that's, that's kind of absorbent. That's kind of far-fetched. But we do understand, you know, you are one of the pastors, so God favors you. That's not why. God favors me not because I'm a pastor. God favors me because I am a child of his. Because I have confessed with my mouth Jesus is Lord. And the other part of it is I asked Daddy for the resources. Now, sometimes Daddy says, no. Sometimes he says, here you go. And sometimes he says, it's for you. And sometimes he says, I'm going to use you as the conduit for others in the resources that he gives us. So one of the great pieces of advice that I received in my training in dealing with trust is if I want to have more spendable assets, then I need to avoid debt. And what, what I mean by that is Proverbs 22, 7 really sums it up. The rich ruler, the rich rules over the poor. And the borrower is the slave of the lender. Did you hear what God's word said? He said the borrower is the slave to the lender. So it's about to get really real in here right now. So because I'm going I'm to just put it out there. How many of us in this room, have stepped into, in our past, our present, have stepped into slavery by incurring excessive debt at some point in time. It's the majority of us in this room, isn't it? You see, slavery means that we have a master who's going to tell us what we can or cannot do. And I'm pretty sure that most of the folks that I know here, most of the folks, including myself in this room, are not real fond of someone telling me what I'm going to do. Now, you can pretty much ask me anything in the world to do, as long as it's legal, ethical, and moral, I'll probably do it. But when you go to putting that finger in my face and tell me you're going to, I have a problem with that. But guess what? I did that at some point to myself and our family the same way Chad's talking about here. I stepped into the realm of slavery and said, oh, 
certain portion of those dollars, God, that you give me, I get to spend because someone else tells me how and when and where and the amount. Not because Chet wants to fund one of the fun, passionate ministries that he's involved in. And so as a result of that, we created a, a process to get out of that of debt. Now, thank you, by the way, for admitting that some of us have, uh, have debt. And, we, and some of us may be in an excessive debt load. So here's some advice. Here's a couple of steps, maybe even an incentive to get you out of debt. Here's what I'd like for you to do. I'd like for you to draw a line in the middle of a piece of paper, maybe the page that you have or another piece of paper. And on the left-hand side, list briefly your debt. And then I want you to get those bills out. And on those bills, they have two areas, the finance charge plus the interest charge. And I want you to add those up on the right-hand side of your slip. And if you need two sheets of paper, three sheets of paper, ten pieces of paper, doesn't matter. I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying add it up. And whatever that total is on the right side of interest and finance charges, I want you to draw a big circle around that, and I want you to remember whatever that number is, whether it's $2, whether it's zero, whether it's $10,000. Knowing this, that is the number. Those are the dollars that you have total access to if you weren't in slavery, if you weren't a bondage to slavery. Now, one of the ways that you can eliminate that, you, you can't just, you know, fold your arms and do the I dream a genie thing and make it disappear, twitch your nose like bewitched. Of course, I'm dating myself, aren't I? I don't know what the current ones that are. Wally Kazam, I think now, maybe. You can't just make it disappear by saying, hey, disappear. But what you can do is you can start a plan. Any of you ever watch a cartoon where someone goes to the top of the mountain and they take a little bitty snowball? And they make a snowball, and then they set it down, and they push it. And what happens to that snowball as it's going down toward the, toward the bottom of, of the mountain? Yeah, you're starting to laugh, right? That snowball gets larger and larger and larger and faster and faster and larger and faster, and it just takes out everything in its way, right? Well, if you'll start that same principle with your debt reduction, your debt reduction can get larger and larger and faster and faster of reducing that debt by taking one small one. When you paid it off, add that total amount that you were paying for that one to the next one and the total amount to the next one and the total amount to the next one, not shortcutting it. So if you paid off $150 here, you add that $150 to this $150. Now you're paying $300. And if you take this $300, you add it to this $300. Now you're paying $600. Whatever it goes up to, as fast as you can eliminate them, eliminate them. That's called a snowball effect. That worked effectively for Claudia and I. We set aside an eight-year plan. We got finished in about four years of doing that because the snowball got larger and faster, and we were able to wipe it out. Now, guess what? We get to make the decision to the bulk of those dollars where they get to go, not someone else. I'm not a slave to that any longer. But that's, one of, that's a process. That's not something that happens overnight. And you need to be diligent in doing that. You heard Pastor Chad mention also Financial Peace University. We have a, a great opportunity. You have a great opportunity through Calvary on several times a year to be able to enroll and to bring and learn some biblical principles of how you can eliminate debt. Now, we'll go ahead and tell you this. It's a $100 investment in yourself. But remember that little note that we talked about on the assets that you were giving away, the incentive that you were giving away? I think you're going to find that $100 really small compared to what you're giving away to know that in a very short time, if you apply those principles, you will have access to those dollars and God will direct those dollars for you. And you can direct those dollars and put them in areas that you're interested in. You see, as we look at trusting God, I mean trusting God, not in our money, and as we develop principles to avoid debt, and if we've incurred debt, we're eliminating that debt, there's a next component that I want us to look at to really be able to gain that financial freedom and conquer our debt quicker, 
And that is to develop a spirit of generosity. Be generous. Proverbs 11, 24 and 25 says, One gives freely yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what should have given, only suffers want. So whoever brings blessing will enrich, and one who waters will himself be watered. You see, ladies and gentlemen, there is no way any of us can ever become more generous than God. It is impossible. You see, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God started the generosity principle and process with his son Jesus, and he carried that principle into every aspect of our lives. You know, we're talking about being generous with the riches God has given us. And I'm living proof that you can be generous. Now, I'm not naturally generous. I don't know about you. I've never met anyone that said, I was born naturally generous. I chose to think of others more highly than myself from the time I was in the bed as a baby. That doesn't happen. That's a spirit that God develops within us. We're born with that selfishness. We're born with that no. We're born with that I don't want. But God chooses to help us develop a spirit of generosity. Now, as a personal example, one of the things every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, the elements, the sacrifice, the generosity that God showed us, when he allowed his son Jesus Christ's body to be broken for the forgiveness of my sins and his blood spilt so that I could fulfill the law and receive that forgiveness of sin, that reminder of what has happened in my life, God reminds me on a day-to-day -day basis of that sacrifice and that grace. And after each time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we have what we ha call a benevolence offering. We have men and ladies standing in the back with offering plates. Can I just tell you what happens to those dollars? It's an opportunity after we've seen God be generous with us that we can be generous. We give those dollars to folks that are in emergency need. Understand, need. We give those dollars three times a year, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter, to you and to others so that you can resource people who are in need of food or clothing, or shelter, or fuel to get back and forth from work. Each time you write a check, or drop monies, or go online, and contribute to the general fund at Calvary Baptist Church, 22 cents out of every dollar or 22 percent of our general fund budget goes back into the community and all over the world to fund ministry because you choose to be generous with your dollars and invest in over 10,000 missionaries worldwide including the United States over six seminaries that are raising up men and women to go to the to the to the mission field to teach and to train and local ministries as well 22 cents goes out that's pretty generous I think and you're to be applauded for being generous you see here's the thing <laughs> the more you give and the more we give the more God gives it's called reciprocity God gives it to us, we give it back to him, he multiplies it, gives it back to us, and we give it back to him. It's an ongoing cycle, and I got to tell you, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. What are we going to get to see? As a result, today alone, there will be over 22 people that will be at the beach today who are going to say, we have become followers of Jesus Christ because we heard God speak clearly through the messages at Calvary. That's investing. You are investing in life change. But just because we trust in our monies, excuse me, in God over our monies, 
and we avoid debt and we choose to be generous doesn't mean that we have arrived. Unless you put this fourth component in place, I'm sorry to tell you, but you're going to fail unless you're willing to put this fourth component into place. And that is plan for the future. If you choose not to plan for the future, you are choosing to fail with your finances and being a good money manager. Proverbs 13, 22 says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous or for the godly. What are children's children? Grandchildren. How many of you have grandchildren? How many of you just love those grandchildren? How many of you pretty much can give grandchildren pretty much anything they want whenever they want it? Let's be honest. You know, it's interesting. The guy's hands went down and the girl's hands went up on that one, right? Do you think there's any mistaking in that? There's two principles that are there. If you, a generous man, a generous man that plans, plans for his children's children. So in essence, we're planning for our children so that we'll have enough assets to plan for our children's children as well. It didn't mean we skip those children. Although some of you may want to skip your children and go straight to the grandchildren. I get that. But the principle is that you set an inheritance. A wise man leaves an inheritance for his children and his children's children. Some of you are going to say, Chet, I, I've worked hard. I just wasn't as fortunate as some. I lived hand to mouth, week to week, pretty much all the time. I don't have a whole lot to leave. Then Can I just encourage you? There is something very valuable that you can leave your children. You can leave your children an inheritance of living a godly life and being committed to following Jesus Christ and a righteous life so that they can see that it was good for grandma and grandpa. It's good for mom and dad. It worked for them. Lord, help me apply it to my life. And every person in this room, if you do not have one in place, the state has one for you, has a will. My preference is that I direct through my will where I want my little pennies to go. But if you don't have one, the state has one, and they'll type your name on it when you die. And I don't know about you, but I would prefer to tell my family how I would like the proceeds that God has entrusted me with. We're going back to planning for the future. Now, it doesn't always have to be a will, trust, or a phenomenal way to transfer assets. And there are actually some really good tax benefits for trust. So get with a financial planner and find out what can help in those areas. Second, if you're a family man here, I want you, I want you looking right at me just for a second. In my former life, I was a life insurance agent, so here you go, you'll get my best pitch here. <laughs> if you love your wife and you love those children, you provide for them. Do you work hard for your family? Well, yeah, I work hard for my family. Then you provide for them, even when you are no longer here. Because actually, an insurance man is a widow's and orphan's best friend. For a few dollars, you're buying money at a reduced rate. That's what you're doing when you invest in insurance. And you provide insurance, death benefits, that are, by the way, tax-free to your children so that they can continue on and you can continue providing one of the most valuable assets you have and that's your earning potential for your family and if you're not going to do it for your family think about your grandchildren if you say chet i don't have grandchildren yet well if you wind up not killing your children you may have grandchildren one day <laughs> And if you have any dollars left and you can spend them, look into disability income and health coverage to help offset the financial risk that you're going to run into in this world. Please hear me. Please hear me. If you do not have a plan 
Every single one of you has a plan to fail. And I do not want to see any one of my family friends that are in this room fail. The same way scripture says, I desire that none should perish. So I want you to hear two things very clearly. The most important thing that I can share with you today is to confess with your mouth Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead so that you will be saved. To all that call on the name of the Son of God will be saved. I want none of you to perish and go to hell. I want you to go to heaven. Like it says in John 14, fret not. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. Do not walk out of this place without surrendering your life to God. Secondly, take care of business. The family business. So that we're a testimony in this community. When folks look and they'll go, you know what? Those Calvary folks take care of their family. And they take care of family business. So when we learn to trust God with our resources and we avoid debt, we develop a generous spirit that allows each one of us to plan for future generations.